today we have a panel on economic crisis and possible alternatives. With us are two economics professors. On my left, uh, uh, I can introduce you to Joachim Becker, professor from the Faculty of Economics at Vienna University. Then Kostas Lapavitsas, he's a, uh, he's a professor, professor at social, at uh, uh, at the uh, SOAS uh, School for Oriental and African Studies. And uh, my further to the left is uh, Zoltan Pogaccia, professor at University of West Hungary. Uh, did I say it right? Okay. Uh, we will talk about current economic state of affairs in Europe. What are its political dimensions? How the how the crisis is being managed? What are and what are the what, what are the possibilities for the left? Uh, every speaker will give a like 15 minutes presentation, and after that we can skip to the Q and A. Uh, Joachim, you will talk about uh, uh, state affairs in the region and in the Balkans, so, and the state of economics in periphery generally. Um, first of all, we can observe during the, before the crisis, during the crisis, and in some cases after the crisis, but in some cases I would say in the continuing crisis, significant differences within the European Union and within the EU. Already before the crisis, one could observe that there emerged something like an export-oriented core around uh, Germany and Germany, out the German manufacturing capital outsourcing production to the Central East European countries, the Visegrad countries to some extent, uh, Slovenia as well, and Transylvania in Romania. On the other hand, there was the periphery or in the international division of labor, rather semi-periphery, but the non-industrial one or the de-industrializing one in Southern Europe and Southeastern Europe. And this periphery being highly dependent on capital inflows main sectors of growth are real estate, construction, tourism, and the growth depending and consumption depending on increasing credits. And Italy and France, to some extent, between the two and the UK and Ireland, as an outsourced outpost of the UK, as highly financialized economies. The crisis itself, though it originated more or less in the financial in the financial sector, the strong growth of the financial sector, financialization can be attributed or could be attributed to the stagnative tendencies in, in the productive economy and those countries highly dependent on foreign inflows of foreign capital became heavily affected by the financial by the financial crisis first the east european countries especially those with very high foreign exchange credits like the baltic countries like hungary romania but as well Slovenia and uh, Croatia and other post-Yugoslav uh, countries. And in the second phase as well, the Eurozone countries in, in the south of Europe, particularly in the beginning Greece. And the industrial, more manufacturing oriented countries they became affected by the effects of the financial crisis on exports and the constraints of, on domestic demand in the importing countries because consumption credits were massively, massively cut. 
Afterwards, we can see that in a certain way, the exporting core recovered more strongly, particularly the German economy, which is specialized in the exports of cars, but as well of capital goods. But German exports shifted to some extent to countries not only outside the Eurozone, but as well outside the EU, particularly to China. And so far, the importance of exports to the EU has diminished for the German, for the German economy. With the recovery of German exports, to some extent, the exports of the Central East European countries recovered as well. And it can be observed that in countries, in parts of, of the Czech Republic and Slovakia, there is almost full employment now. In the Czech Republic's official unemployment rate is only 4.4%. I think it's the lowest in the EU. And now, first time for many years, trade unions in Czech Republic and Slovakia are able to push up wages, at least in some regions. There is now emigration from Serbia to Slovakia, particularly of the Slovak community in Vojvodina, emigrating to, uh, to Trnava and other places in, uh, in, uh, in, in Slovakia. Nevertheless, the east of Slovakia hardly is experienced an upturn that should be, mentioned, should be mentioned as well. Secondly, in those countries, it can be observed that the financialized part of growth, rising housing prices, rising private household indebtedness is picking up again. So certain features which led to the crisis can be seen again. In addition, the specialization of countries like Slovakia, Czech Republic, or Hungary is very narrow, particularly focused on the car industry. I would regard it as being very, very vulnerable. So far, this upturn, I would say it is very, it is very shaky. In Southeastern Europe, <coughs> The crisis was deeper in, than in Central and East European countries. In addition, in many cases, particularly among those, in, among those cases, Croatia, the recession was very long, several, several years. The domestic demand has been massively constrained because foreign capital is not flowing in and because of the austerity policies prescribed by the European, European Union. The exchange rates tend to be overvalued. Kuna has been nominally stable for many, many years, and this has been, from my point of view, one of the problems of the Croat economy. One of the few sectors, productive sectors, doing still relatively well in southeastern Europe, <coughs> is the agro-industrial agro sector. And this is a sector linked to the differential ground rent, and so far, certain type of protection is existing. And <coughs> here comes the story of AgroCore in. As um, you, most of you are from Croatia, I mean, AgroCore, I would say it was something, trying to construct something like a Yugoslav, almost Yugoslav monopoly in retail trade with very strong links to the agro-industrial sector. Doing it on credit, massive, massive indebting itself in order to finance the expansion. I read the book Gazda and what was mentioned in the book, one of the mechanisms of expansion was paying suppliers very late. Even I heard being in the past in, in Croatia about a big company paying always very late and paying later and later during the crisis. And now, I mean, AgroCore, accounting for 10 to 15% the whole group of the GDP, 
it seems to be almost insolvent. Being highly dependent on uh, the goodwill of the banks and even more on the goodwill of the Croat government. A special law was passed, Lex Agrogor. And obviously, there is a will to shift the burden to the small, rather to the small suppliers and to bail out. Today, I read in National uh, that, that weekly Agrocor should be, should be uh, rescued. But the question is, should it be rescued as a private company? Or shouldn't it be, I mean, something for something? State shares for, for example, state shares for state support. Yeah, that would be a different type of debt for equity swap, for example. So far, I would argue there might be an argument for a strong agro-industrial complex, but not in Todoric's hands. And obviously, a crisis of agro-core is a crisis of the Croat uh, economy because I would say it is affecting one of the two main sectors, the other one being tourism. Uh, and so far, it is a very important question how that question is to be, is to be solved. Uh, and that agro-industry jointly with tourism is one of the key sectors, I would say, I think it clearly demonstrates the semi-peripheral character of the Croat economy. And in Serbia, I mean, it is not very different with less tourism, but agro-industry again being one of the few sectors. What we can see as well is changes in, in, the, political, in the political side. And not only in the periphery, but also in some of the core countries, I would say it is often nationalist, oligarchic for political formations and parties emerging. And in the Czech Republic, I mean, there is a company called Agrofert, agro-industrial as well, there it is not one of the high officials, former officials of that holding that is the Minister of Finance, but uh, Andre Babiš, the owner of uh, Agrofert, is a Minister of Finance. And now, at the moment, there's a big coalition crisis because of Babiš being involved in many, many scandals. And his party, Anno, I would regard it as a purely oligarchic Formation. It is financed by him, it is headed by him, and in so far, I would say there is a certain change in the composition of the, of the political parties, and the oligarchic trends that could already be observed in large parts of former Yugoslavia, for example, or in Ukraine, now extending more and more to the core from my point of view. At times in a nationalist dressing, at times uh, in, even in an anti-corruption dressing, mm -hmm. but being right, clearly right-wing formations and taking advantage, at least temporarily, of the crisis of representation. And I would argue that the crisis of representation can be ascribed to economic and social policies, mainly reflecting the interests of the bourgeoisie and the upper middle class. And the other interests vary to a very limited extent. And therefore, political formations try to emphasize other lines of conflict, mainly national lines, at times anti-corruption lines, in order to deflect from the class character. What is, what we can ob observe as well, that is the decline of social democracy. At times it is practically disappearing, like in Poland. And the inability of the left to fill the vacuum in many cases, with very, very few exceptions. Strujena Levice, to some extent in Slovenia, is a partial exceptions, the success of Mélenchon in France to some extent is an exception, but it remains to be seen whether he, is, he will be able to sustain a broader movement and political party in the end. 
question is how the left die Linke in Germany will be, will be doing. Yeah, and so far, I would say there is clearly something like a political crisis as well, and the economic crisis, from my point of view, it is not over, though in some countries there has been something like an upturn, but it is very questionable how long it will be lasting. And the EU as a whole <coughs> is banking on neo-mercantilism now. That is on exporting and not importing much. And both the exchange rate policies of the ECB and the austerity policies of the European Commission and many of the national governments are in line with this neo-mercantilist policies. But, I mean, the Chinese want to export more than import. The Japanese want to export more than import. And the US government is not willing anymore to import more than it does export. So far, I would say that strategy at the international level is encountering certain limits. Yeah? And that cannot be successful in the longer run. Sultan, you'll also be talking about state of economic state of affairs in Europe and its political dimensions. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, basically, how I understood this talk today was to speak a little bit, a little bit about the economic. Uh, systematic economic issues, uh, um, why we are in a crisis, how to understand the nature of the crisis and connect that to the role of the left. So how does the left connect to these narratives of the crisis? And I, I think there are three schools of why we are in a crisis. I'm going to take a big picture view here of why we are in a crisis. And by big picture, I don't just mean the Eurozone in the last seven, eight years, but I'm gonna take a 30, 40 year uh, view of uh, how we got into this crisis, uh, beginning with the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, and I think there are three general broad schools of where we are with this crisis today. The first school is what I would call, for simplicity's sake, the neoclassical school. So the neoclassical school, which is represented in the mainstream media by the mainstream political forces, basically says that the crisis is pretty much over. So growth is back, uh, employment has rebounded, uh, and with certain exceptions, you know, which are basket cases like Greece, which is its own fault, and you know, but basically, in the majority of the world, the crisis is over, and we have solved the issues, and there's nothing wrong. We are once again on a path to growth and prosperity, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, the problem is that part of the left, I, in my view, still belongs to it. So the more kind of Blairite, third way uh, part of the left, which is you know just the liberal social democrats, uh, are basically part of this neoclassical consensus that we have solved the crisis. There is nothing to talk about. The second school I would call broadly a Keynesian school. A Keynesian school which says that the crisis could be solved if you had more demand from the lower classes. So basically it's a kind of a, an under-consumptionist school. I would say that the central character in this story would be Thomas Piketty. And Thomas Piketty's famous book, Capital in the 21st Century, basically says that in the last couple of decades, we have had a redistribution from the poor to the rich. The rich have become super rich, uh, and the poor have lost purchasing power. 
And what needs to be done is a redistribution from the rich to the poor, because the, the rich tend to save, and if you save, that's not part of the circulation in, in the economy. There's, it doesn't affect any demand in the economy. So if you impose taxes on the rich, for instance, a wealth tax or a more progressive uh, tax on income, you get to redistribute, and then you have <clears throat> a... Uh, higher demand from the lower classes, and then the economy could be restarted. So there would be growth again, and that would rebound us and put us on a sustainable path. People who belong to this school are obviously Piketty, his friend Saez, but also people like Paul Krugman, uh, Stiglitz, mainstream Keynesian economists, I think would share this consensus, and I think that part of the left, at least in Europe, uh, or also in the Democratic Party in the US, who have been disappointed with the third way social democratic era, I think have moved towards this kind of Keynesian alternative. So you would have uh, people like Bernie Sanders, also part of the, the Labour Party, also some parts of the SPD in Germany uh, have moved from the neoclassical consensus towards this kind of Keynesian consensus. Um, <laughs> debatable, at least, that's debatable. I mean, at least they sometimes adhere to this. Whether they've really moved on is, is already a big question. But what I'm trying to say here is that they have definitely haven't moved further than that. So that's the furthest that they are willing to go, is what I'm trying to say, is that when they are at their radical best, you know, after a couple of beers, when they're really radical, that's, that's as far as they're willing to go, to say, well, we need some kind of Keynesian redistribution and then everything else would be solved. And then they get sober again the next morning and move back to the neoclassical concept. So I'm, I'm with you on this, that this isn't really, it, it's not coming from the heart. It's basically coming from the realization that if you, are, if you are a social democrat and if you are a neoclassical consensus, there's nothing to differentiate you from the conservatives. So they, you have to come up with something and, you know, therefore you mimic at least that you are some kind of a social democrat by becoming a Keynesian. That's the second school. And I think the third school is an interesting one. Um, the third school basically says that there is a systemic issue deeper than simply a question of redistribution from the rich to the poor. Namely, this has to do with things like the falling rate of profit, indebtedness, uh, and the unsustainability of the capitalist system as a whole. So this is a more radical issue here. And um, the story is something like this, that there was a fall, there is a falling rate of profit. So if you observe the rate of profit after the Second World War, it's basically falling until the 1980s. Uh, and that's in line with the Marxian prediction that there would be a falling rate of profit. And then it stabilizes from the 80s onwards. So until today, even increases a little bit, but basically stabilizes from the 1980s. Um, and this is where I challenged Professor Lapavitsis uh, yesterday or the day before, because he believes that what you can see is what there is. So if there is a falling rate of profit and then it stops falling, then basically the, the falling rate of profit story is not viable because what you see is what there is. Now, there are, there are other people... And you know, part of that story is obviously financialization. I don't want to repeat the financialization story because Professor Lapavitz has just gave an excellent talk on this and his book is one of the best, I think, or maybe the best in explaining why this financialization has happened. So that's, that's, uh, that's clearly a part of the story. Uh, with banks turning towards uh, uh, consumers away from, uh, from corporations and corporations becoming a little bit more like financial companies. So that's definitely part of the story. But where I think this is connected to the system as a whole uh, is that there are, there are some authors 
who actually say the following, that in the 19, by the 1970s, uh, there is a realization that there is this financial, that there is this falling rate of profit, and neoliberalism, which comes to effect with people like Pinochet, Thatcher, uh, Reagan, uh, Schroeder, uh, Mitterrand, Blair, Papandreou, etc., etc. So basically, neoliberalism is a an, a social ideology, which is a counteraction to the falling rate of profit. How does neoliberalism counteract the falling rate of profit? Here I refer, I think the best reference is a German economic sociologist called Wolfgang Streeck. Wolfgang Streeck basically says that until the 1980s, the welfare state used to finance itself from, uh, from taxes. So basically you collected the taxes and you, you, you financed the expenditure from the taxes and there was a very low level of indebtedness. Those of you who are here for uh, Professor Lapavitsis's talk, you saw that basically until the 80s, the level of indebtedness is low. Four states, four households, four financial corporations, and for the rest of the economy. So basically, there's, it's not a debt-driven capitalism. It's a tax-driven capitalism. You tax and you spend. But since the rate of uh, profit was declining, what happened with neoliberalism is they basically, the state began to ensure or to reverse this falling rate of profit by doing the following things. For instance, lowering taxation. The taxation was lowered on corporations, on uh, the, the highest income brackets for personal income tax, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they basically uh, lowered uh, taxation, the tax burden on corporations, which increased their rate of profitability. What they also did was they deregulated labor relations. So in most of these countries until the 1980s, we used to have a very strong system of bargaining, of wage bargaining. In Scandinavia, up until today, they have this, but they were even bargaining at the national level, but also in places like Germany, Austria, uh, many other countries, France, etc. There was a very strong system of wage bargaining, which meant trade unions were strong, and trade unions were very close to the social democratic parties, and they had a large membership and, and strong competencies, and the wage share of income was pretty high. So out of the GDP, which a country produced each year, um, trade unions could basically ensure workers a large share of that national income each year. Now, when this was deregulated, and it was deregulated in the 1980s, 1990s by people like Thatcher on the left, people like Schroeder on the right, basically they ended up with much weaker trade unions uh, and a much lower share uh, wage share of the national income, which also basically that's, this means lower wages, and lower wages means a higher profitability for uh, for for capital. Uh, so, in effect, the indebtedness is a compensation for the lowered wages, because if you pay lower wages to people, they will have less demand in the economy. There will be less demand for the, for the goods produced by the companies. Uh, so you have to have uh, debt. For instance, household debt is a compensation for lower demand by households. This is what a guy called Colin Crouch calls uh, privatized Keynesianism. So basically, you, instead of the state doing Keynesianism, you have uh, households borrowing and consuming from that. Um, you also have state debt increasing. And the reason why state debt increasing is because there's deficit financing. You lower the taxes. There's this Lafferite 
uh, argument that if you lower taxes, there will be more revenues, but when you lower taxes, actually there will be less revenues and not more revenues. So you keep having budget deficits, and when you have budget deficits, you have uh, increasing indebtedness of the states. So to cut the long short story short, basically you have the growth of debt, which is financing uh, this unsustainable system of capitalism. Uh, and in addition to fiscal deficits, you also have the monetary side increasingly doing that. So when fiscal, when debt on the fiscal side grows very large, there is a realization that this is now excessive. And then you have the monetary side coming into the picture, which is much less visible for ordinary people. So ordinary people, because they have elections every four years, they pay much more attention to governments overspending and accumulating debt, but they, they, they have much less attention for uh, central banks basically printing money and pumping it into the economy, which is what the Fed was doing in the US and what the European Central Bank has been doing in Europe for a while. So, the reason why we don't feel the recession as they did feel it in the 1930s was because of this fiscal and monetary stimulus going into the economy. It's basically hiding the fact that there are structural problems with the economy, and that structural problem is uh, reflected, I think, at the deepest level in the decreasing profitability of uh, of capitalism, which is hidden because of neoliberalism. So basically, uh, contrary to what Professor Lapavitsas uh, was saying a couple of days ago, I think I, I tend to be on the side of people like um, Steve Keen, who says that debt has driven the economies in the last couple of years. Uh, Michael Roberts, who draws attention to the decreasing profitability. And you, you refer to Anwar Sheikh and his way of measuring the, 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 the rate of uh, decrease of uh, profitability. This afternoon, I checked his book. Uh, this is very, very interesting book, Capitalism, which he published in 2016. And I read again the chapter on profitability after the Second World War. And I think even, even Anwar Sheikh says that there is a decreasing profitability which is compensated by neoliberalism. So even Amba Sheikh believes that had it not been for neoliberalism, the decline in profitability would have, would have continued into the 2000s and until today. So basically this massive stimulus from debt has compensated for it. So I'm very curious what you will say uh, after this. I, I, I'm very curious uh, how you explain that there isn't this connection between debt, indebtedness, neoliberalism, and the decreasing rate of profitability. So basically, the point that I'm trying to make here is that there are deeper connections here which the mainstream left is ignoring. Uh, social democratic parties are not in this discussion. So this kind of discussion, these kinds of debates that I'm describing here is carried out by a rather, I would say, a fringe um, uh, amongst economists. So the people that I've been mentioning, Wolfgang Streeck, Anders Sheik, uh, Michael Roberts, these people are, are nowhere in the mainstream of the economics profession, and they're also not included in the debates of the mainstream social democratic parties. Um, and my fear is that unless you include these authors, but even, even Professor Lapavitsas himself, many others who, um, if, if you don't include these authors in the mainstream social democratic debates, uh, then I think you are moving from one delusion to another delusion. So from the neoclassical delusion, you, you, you walk into the Keynesian delusion that you can basically, this kind of Piketty delusion that you can put everything right by taxing the poor a little bit more. I have to say that even that is opposed by the mainstream. 
So if you look at what happened in Greece in 2015, that was a Keynesian program. The Thessaloniki program of Syriza in 2015 was a Keynesian program. And even that was banned basically by the European establishment. Uh, so even the second school, the Keynesian school, is kind of banned by the mainstream. Uh, it's being discussed, but it's banned. Uh, to move into the, th to the third school and have these discussions on the deeper structural problems of capitalism is actually excluded from the discussion. Um, now, at the same time, there are a lot of people in society who are actually feeling this. So there are people who, whose incomes have stagnated or declined. They have become precarious in their living standards. They have grown accustomed to living on debt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And these people do not feel that the left represents them. So I think the, the reason why you have seen the rise of right-wing parties uh, in many, many places from Donald Trump to Viktor Orban to Jean-Marie Le Pen to whoever you want to mention, Marine Le Pen, whoever you want to mention, is due to the fact that the right has taken over the rhetoric in economic terms of the left. So they, they use the left-wing narrative of what goes on, coupled with a right-wing ethnicized view of the world. So they actually try, they, they speak to these impoverished or precarious people in economic terms, but they also add that your troubles are because there are gypsies who don't want to work, and there are, I don't know, Jews who exploit you, or the lazy Greeks, and the lazy corrupt Greeks, or the hardworking Germans and reliable hardworking Germans. And there's this ethnicized view uh, coupled with the traditional social, the old school social democratic appeal to, uh, to economic structures. And since the left is almost in indistinguishable from the liberals, uh, the left doesn't appeal to a large enough group of people in society to be electable. So that's why we don't see left-wing parties being elected almost anywhere. Um, I always feel that the ground where we should be is almost empty. There are people to the right of this. The social democrats have moved to the liberal position. And there are people to the left of this. There's a radical fringe which is stuck in some kind of 1950s nostalgia for people like Hugo Chavez or Maduro or some kind of completely, you know, unsustainable, crazy nostalgia for something that's impossible. But exactly the ground where, which should be occupied by the left, is left empty. Uh, there's almost nobody there. And these discussions that I'm describing are very rare. It's not visible. It's very much in the, on the back burner. You, you have to go to places like Subversive to actually have these discussions. But it's not present in the mainstream organs of the broader left. Thank you. Thank you, Zoltan. OK. Uh, Costas, you can respond to these uh, remarks on is, is it a, is it a you know, profitability crisis or financial crisis? But uh, let's please not uh, uh, turn this panel into this uh, uh, dense uh, theoretical theoretical debate. Uh, so, so you could also also uh, talk about uh, this what uh, Joachim was saying uh, about the dynamics uh, between core and periphery with Germany in center. And how and what is political dimensions of that? Yeah, don't worry. I, I will give you the history of the world in ten minutes. It's okay. This and that. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay. Let's start from the beginning a little bit. 
there was a massive crisis in 2007, 2009, as we all know. Um, in truth, and I said this at an interview just a few hours ago, in truth, the majority of the left did not foresee the crisis. Let me, don't make any mistake about that, because the left likes to come up afterwards and say, oh, we knew capitalism is unstable and so on. In truth, in 2007, very, very few people uh, on the left in Europe actually realized what was coming. Because the world didn't look like a crisis world at that time. Anyway, the crisis happened. It was very sharp from 2007 to 2009, and then it subsided in most of the world, except for Europe, where it picked up again in 2010, and it became a Eurozone crisis. And there, another sharp face took place for another three years until 2012, and then it sort of fizzled out again. It kind of stabilized again. Here, in terms of the colleagues who spoke before me, I'm essentially challenged to speak on what was the crisis generally and what form did it take in Europe and, and, and why. Now, what I can say about the, the general crisis, the, the global crisis that broke out, in other words, the fundamental sort of turmoil that emerged is that, as Zoltan has observed, in truth, it showed something deep having gone wrong. It's a, it was a structural crisis. Not a crisis of policy, not a crisis of contingency, not a crisis of accident. It was a crisis of something deep that went wrong, structural. I think, as people of the left, we must begin with that. The question is what? What was this deep structural thing that went wrong? If you simply say, oh, I was capitalism that caused it, you're not saying anything. Well, of course, what would it be? So feudalism? Of course, it was capitalism. The question is what? Why? Because capitalism is not the same now as it was 50 years ago, as it was 100 years ago, or 150 years ago. And the form of crisis is not the same now as it was in the days that Karl Marx wrote his books, and, and then other people afterwards wrote the classic Marxist analysis. These are very different crises than the ones we experienced. And let me make it clear for you. The crisis broke out in the United States, in the financial markets of the United States, in the subprime section of the real estate market. You know what the subprime section is? It is the section that deals with housing given to the lowest of the low in the, in the American working class, who are often racially segregated. They tend to be blacks and Latins, because that's how that society is organized. Now, if you told Karl Marx in his day that you will get a global capitalist crisis because the poorest of the working class had borrowed too much to buy houses, he would have thought that you're crazy. And yet this, this is exactly what happened. This is exactly what happened um, in 2007, 2009, and that indicates what is different about the capitalism we're going through, right? To answer that, and I'm trying quickly to deal with what Zoltan rightly pointed out, to answer that, I, I leave aside the Krugmans and the Piketty's and all these other people. There is very little that is of interest there. Um, but to, to deal with the third um, current that Zoltan mentioned, there are basically two approaches that emerged that tried structurally to explain what happened in 2007-2009 from essentially, broadly speaking, the Marxist or the radical tradition. One approach, which is still numerically the dominant one, is the one that Zoltan spoke favorably about. Uh, and it is the one that stresses the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Now, I've grown up with the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. I went to school with it. I studied at university with it. I've tried desperately to find it empirically. I'm still trying, okay? Because the truth is, empirically, the rate of profit that we can measure for the mature capitalist economies has not fallen since about 1981, 1982. It's a long time, right? Now, some of you might have made better measurements than me, 
but I've tried to use the best available techniques, and I can assure you, it's not falling, right? What does that mean? First of all, it means that it's not falling. If I get 60 numbers, this is what we're doing. If we get 60 numbers and put them on the numerator, the profit aggregate, and 60 numbers and I put them in the denominator, the GDP aggregate, or the capital advanced aggregate, I'll get the rate of profit. These are 120 numbers. There are people in this world who think that if you take these 120 numbers and divide them and get a line, you will look you will have explained the past, the present, and the future of capitalism. This is black magic. This is not economics. Right? And it has never been Marxist economics. This is a type of economics that has emerged in the last three, four decades, and it actually signifies the decline of Marxism. Marxism used to be a very powerful current in economic theory. It, it is not so anymore. As Marxism has declined, this kind of overemphasis on the putative law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall as explaining everything has become more and more dominant. <clears throat> Read the classic Marxists, the classical Marxists of the Second International. The Hilferdings, the Bowers, Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg, the great Marxists. You're not going to find the famous tendency of the rate of profit to fall as a law explaining everything. You're not going to find it there. Crises are complex things. And they knew it. Marx knew it. So when we look at the crisis of 2007, 2009, and bearing in mind that the measured rate of profit is not falling, we need another explanation. Right? We need something more complex, something which I think is more <coughs> multidimensional and more sophisticated. And here the financialization story has emerged. Capitalism has changed. Finance is more important. Finance is insinuated in every aspect of economic activity. It has penetrated personal and household activity. Ha finance generates instability. Ha finance is integral and structural. This isn't, this isn't to say that because you're not emphasizing the falling rate of profit, you're not making it a structural crisis. It is structural very much, but structural in that way. I think this approach tells you more about the capitalism we're living through and tells you more about the sources of profit, the way profit works, how big business is making profit in the United States and elsewhere, the role of households in this, the role of banks, the role of debt, which has rightly been mentioned, and how debt has expanded precisely at the time when profit became stabilized. Okay? And that became an avenue for financial profit to rise. As aggregate profitability became stagnant, financial profitability, financial profit went through the roof. They began to make profits through banks and so on. This is an important development of contemporary capitalism. The crisis of 2007-2009 was a crisis of financialization in my reading of it. And what has happened since then is a stabilization of financialization. The state intervened in the United States, has stabilized finance, it has stabilized financial profits to the degree to which it can. And at the moment, financialization is teetering on the edge. We don't know which way it's going to go. It hasn't, the world, the capitalism has not definancialized. We've gone, we have not gone into reverse. But we're not advancing either. Capitalis, capitalism in the mature world is stagnating in that respect. We will see how it goes. And much will depend on the decisions of the US state and other states across the world. I haven't got time to say more about this. I want to move on to Europe, because <clears throat> financialization of capitalism, which I think is a general characteristic of the last three, four decades, of course, has not taken the same form in every country and in every area. And in Europe, a particular type of financialization has emerged, pivoting on the monetary union. The monetary union has been instrumental to the financialization we've seen in Europe, the type of financialization we've had. Because the German economy is not financialized in the same way as the French economy is, and it's not financialized in the same way as the British economy is or the peripheral economies. We've had varieties of financialization, uh, which I can't go into in any great depth, but I'll tell you what the outcomes are. And this financialization in Europe, I repeat, has been refracted through the monetary union. The monetary union has proven fundamental to the evolution of Europe. 
How? I haven't got much time, I'll be um, quick about it. When the monetary union was introduced, back in the late 1990s, the talk was still very much about Europeanism, the common future of the European people, the, um, um, the Europe of solidarity and convergence that we were going to create. Then the crisis came, which I think is a crisis of financialization, I'll come back to it, and then we've had six or seven years since the outbreak of the crisis and the management of it in Europe. Now we know what kind of Europe is emerging, and Joachim summed it up. There is no doubt now about the Europe that's emerging. We might have discussed it in 2010, we might have discussed it in 2011, 2009, we might have debated it. Now we know the Europe that has emerged and continues to emerge is a Europe which contains a core and a periphery. The cap capitalism in Europe, focusing on the monetary system it created, has recreated divisions between core and periphery, fresh divisions, new ones, because capitalism tends to do that. I say this because much of the left previously had forgotten about this and had imagined that Europe, this transcendental Europe, will, be, will eliminate this tendency to create core and periphery, and all of us will belong to the core. No, no, that's not what's happening. We now know, this is not for debate, we now know, and you know, I'm glad that this was summed up in this way previously, because I said similar things a couple of days ago. There is a core in Europe, it's very hard, and the core of the core, is basically the German industrial complex. This German industrial complex contains basically cars, chemicals, and machine tools, so, or machines. That's basically the core of German strength. Um, and that economic core through its actions and performance, has created a number of peripheries in Europe. Not one periphery, a number of peripheries. There is a periphery which is in the Mediterranean, which has already been mentioned. The periphery of Spain, Greece, and Portugal. These economies are economies with weak productivity growth, weak manufacturing sectors, uh, low ability to um, generate jobs, Historically, the, 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 the public sector has acted as, a, as an employment-creating uh, mechanism. And these economies have been forced into the opposite of what they've been doing so far, through the core. They cannot generate these jobs through, through the public sector, and they've got high unemployment, and they are sending their trained people to the corner. They are, they've become exporting uh, uh, centers for labor, for trained labor that goes to the core. So there's this periphery which is guaranteed low, gro low growth, as far as the eye can see. There is, second, the periphery that is more closely attached to the German industrial sector. They're basically appendages of German industry. Uh, places like the Czech Republic, places like Slovakia, Slovenia, areas of Poland, areas of uh, Romania, and so on. Essentially, what we've had there is uh, German industrial capital investing directly, incorporating these areas into the core, but as a subsidiary members of it, areas that provide uh, trained personnel, again, and resources that allow German industry to uh, export, because this is an exporting uh, agent. And then there is the third periphery, which is, in a sense, the Wild West of Europe, except it's in the East. Uh, countries which are not in one periphery nor in the other, countries which don't know exactly where they belong, which are mired in stagnation or are even retreating. Uh, Ukraine is the classic example here, but there are other areas, and I'm afraid Croatia belongs to that, as does Serbia and so on. That has been created by the European Union, this reality, and by the monetary union, uh, at its um, core, at its heart. Why and how? It's important to understand that. Many people think that German domination 
in Europe has emerged because of the inherent competitive advantages of German business and the German capital and German technology and German efficiency generally. There's a Teutonic myth that is uh, perpetuated across much of Europe. This is not true. This is not true. German investment is very weak. Domestic investment is very weak. Investment has been declining in Germany. German big businesses do not invest. They have financialized. They have financialized just as much as many other big businesses. They play financial games. They are sitting on enormous piles of money. They've got huge surpluses, which they're not investing. This is not a country that invests. This is not China. If you have a visit to Germany, it's enough to show you this. And the infrastructure of Germany reflects that. Because at the same time as these big businesses not investing, there's been austerity in the German state. So the German infrastructure is not the best in the world. All you need to do is catch a flight to Germany and you will see the airports. Oh, you can take the train. I mean, <laughs> you don't have to take the train. <laughs> so, That's a good reflection of that. So, so what I'm saying is, it is not true that Germany has succeeded to, in dominating Europe, which it does, because of investment, technology, and so on. The secret is elsewhere. The secret is in the, 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 the relationship between German capital and German labor. And German labor has been kept under restraint. German wages have been kept under restraint for a, for a very long time. The German labor market is deeply differentiated with precarious jobs, with uncertainty, people counting the pennies and trying to make do. That's the kind of capitalism that he has obtained in Germany that restrains domestic demand, insists on austerity, and looks at exports where it seeks to gain competitive advantage by keeping wages down or by enjoying uh, competitive exchange rates because the euro is weak. So Germany dominated the domestic market of uh, Europe, the Eurozone market, through the suppression of wages, and now exports to China, and it exports to the United States, which are the main export uh, um, or orientation for, for German business now because the European market is repressed, and it does so because the Euro is weak. So a situation has emerged through the monetary union whereby German industrial capital uh, wins under any circumstances. That's the reality. That, that's the, that's the reality that has emerged. And the biggest problem for uh, German capitalism in this respect, for German exporting capitalism in this respect, in this situation that he has created, is not really from the periphery. The periphery is either pacified or integrated into the productive uh, machine of Germany. The biggest problem for German exporting capital is actually the, the rest of the core. France is the biggest source of instability. And an even bigger source of instability is, of course, Italy, which is not exactly core and not exactly periphery. France cannot survive with Germany in this system. It cannot compete. France continues to have a persistent divergence of competitiveness relative to Germany, and it doesn't know how to deal with it. In the past, there would have been a devaluation of the French franc. That's not possible. France, therefore, is pushed to adopt policies of repressing wages and austerity. Well, good luck to Mr. Macron, if he wishes to do that. Good luck to him. He will not succeed, he will not succeed very easily. And that is the reason why, if he goes down this path, the next president of France will be called Le Pen, almost certainly. Right. So, so we've got, France is a big, is a big problem for, for Germany in this, respect, in this respect, and Italy is a very bigger problem. Italy is an even bigger problem because Italy has got the only industrial concentration in Europe that can compete with the, Germ with the German one. There's nothing else in Europe that, that, that counts for anything industrially. France has destroyed its industry. Britain destroyed its industry. The only other industrial complex worth anything in Europe is in northern Italy. And it is a domestic one. Yes. And Italy, though, contains also the south. So the Italian social formation has got a major problem as far as the Italian ruling class is concerned. However, how to position Italy in relation to Germany is a major problem for the Germans as well. Because Italy cannot continue to exist in this way with Germany. 
The, the whole of the economy is stagnating, and it will continue to stagnate. stagnate. It's under low intensity austerity pressure for 15 years, Italy, essentially. There's a limit to that. Okay, there's a limit to that. The only reason Italy hasn't got a rising balance of payments deficit at the moment is because it's actually suppressing demand all the time. There's a limit to how far you can do that. So here is the Europe that has emerged. It's a deeply unstable Europe. It's a Europe that is dominated by Germany as the biggest exporter, the biggest industrial producer, and the biggest lender, therefore because that's what happened when you've got the surpluses. But this is, a, this is a victory for German capital that has got very slender foundations in many ways, as is shown by weak investment, weak infrastructure advance, and so on. This is not a capitalism that actually is going anywhere in Europe particularly. This isn't the, this isn't the concentration of capital that can compete globally with any confidence, in my judgment. Its, it's, it's foundations are weak. I haven't got time to go into it in any, uh, great, uh, at any great length. I want to come back to what we need to say for the five minutes we've got. Much of what we need to say has already been mentioned, so I can be very quick. In my judgment, the program we should propose obviously needs to vary from country to country. Not all countries in Europe are the same, as I've just pointed out. The program cannot be the same in one periphery as in another, and it cannot be the same in the periphery as in the core, for reasons that I've just summed up. However, the basic parameters of it uh, have got similarities, and it allows, therefore, they allow, therefore, for the left to begin to communicate transnationally and to produce a real internationalism at long last. Not an internationalism of big words, but an international, internationalism of concrete uh, policy. And there are two things that are fundamental, both of which we've examined, uh, I and my collaborators and so on, in the case of Greece, which is the worst possible case in this situation. And what we're proposing is that, at least for countries of the periphery, we should be looking, first of all, at strengthening domestic demand. We need a boost of domestic demand that will have a fiscal dimension, taxes and public spending for investment and so on, and that could be financed through monetary expansion. So we're looking for that kind of thing in the first instance, and that could apply elsewhere. Europe needs to strengthen its domestic economy. Even the core needs that. Even Germany needs that, as I've, as I've explained. That's the first thing we need to do. And the second thing we need to do in Europe is industrial policy. Some parts of Europe are now at the level of developing countries. Essentially, we contain several developing countries in Europe, and Greece is approaching the level of a developing country. Therefore, we need industrial strategy. We need the strategy that supports uh, industry, the recreation of the secondary sector, which means controlling of, uh, control over, uh, over uh, credit, over banking, support for industry, uh, uh, and so on. This means two things. You don't need the monetary union. The sooner you get out of it and the sooner you dismantle it, the better for all of us. This is a mad <coughs> arrangement that has obtained over Europe. And second, we need to confront key policies of the European Union itself. Competition policy by the European Union uh, is a disaster. And even the industrial policy that the European Union is proposing is very weak. We need to confront these policies and we need to argue for alternative policies for Europe that will include controls over capital flows, controls over banks, uh, and so on. Now then, yeah, this, is, this is not rocket science, right? We know how, it's clear. All, it, it's clear what needs doing, uh, even at the level of uh, games and economics and so on. It is the politics that's the problem. It is the politics that's the problem. What kind of politics for this? And what kind of left politics? What we see in Europe right now is the return of nationalism. And more specifically, the return of the idea of the nation and the return of the idea of the motherland, which many of us thought that this had gone. Why is that happening and what kind of return is that? This is, it varies from place to place. In the Balkans it's different. The Balkans has always been very virulent, and very poisonous when it comes to these ideas. But the use of the, of, of, of the idea of the nation, of the motherland, in much of the rest of Europe is not of this variety. In certain parts of Europe it is simply 
a popular expression for the need for social democracy, essentially, for controls over housing, over education, over employment. Um, it, 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 is the, it, is, it is a popular response to the need to oppose capital in big business. It is a perception of loss of sovereignty, sovereignty where you live and where you work, and of the country as a whole, in the face of foreign capital, in the face of transnational uh, organizations that work in favor of capital. And the popular strata of Europe respond in this way. Why? Because the left is not offering what he has traditionally offered to those layers. Historically, the left emerged as the current in Europe that was prepared to say, we are against the institutions of Europe as they exist. We are prepared to overturn them and destroy them. And we want to destroy capitalism and create socialism. It meant many things over the years, but that's what the left has historically said. And that seemed revolutionary and radical. And that appeal to the plebeian layers, to the working class and the poor, as they sought to defend control over where they live and control over their employment and, and, and rights. The left has stopped saying that. What the left tells the poor now is, we need to fight for Europe. We need to fix Europe. We need to go to Brussels and take part in the debates in the European Parliament to fix directive uh, such and such and instruction the other. And altogether, we can create a better Europe. Yeah, of course. And therefore, the result is the left loses its contact and its organic links with the poor and with the, with, uh, with the working class. Because the left appears to be siding with precisely the people who are imposing the policies that are causing uh, what has happened in Europe in the last few years. And so the, the poor of Europe turn to the, to the right. And the right are often using the terminology of the left. So we see complete absurdities. We see people like Le Pen and others using expressions and policies and, 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 and terms that the left has historically used and turning them into fascist slogans. And we've allowed that to happen. So what kind of politics for the left? I haven't got the answer fully to give you, but I'll tell you what I think after my experience with Syriza and so on. We need a left that understands the meaning of popular sovereignty, understands the meaning of national sovereignty from the left, and understands the idea of internationalism from the left and not big business internationalism, that understands that democracy without sovereignty means nothing, precisely nothing. If you're not sovereign where you live, Democracy is an empty word. You can be elected. The people can invest you with a popular will. You can have a program. You will go to parliament, and you will achieve precisely nothing if, you, if you're not sovereign. If you don't control the levers of power where you are, and if you cannot position yourself in relation to, uh, uh, to other powers in Europe. We need the return of these ideas, and we need them from the left. How are we going to do it? is a matter of debate, and occasions like this are very important for discussing it. Because the experience of Eastern Europe and the Balkans in this respect is of paramount importance. So long may this continue, and hopefully an answer will begin to emerge soon. Thank you. So uh, Joachim, can I turn to you? Uh, Costa said that the uh, economic situation uh, in Europe has been stabilized for the moment, especially the monetary union be, has been stabilized. How do you see what are, what are possible threats and ruptures to this stability, especially in, re, in, uh, in relation to France and uh, Italy? We know that uh, it, it, uh, Italian banking sector is in a huge problems. The biggest uh, banks have a lot of tox, uh, to toxic assets on their, uh, balance, on their balance sheets. And how do you see this, uh, these threats and uh, po possible ruptures being politically managed in Europe, and what are, the, what are the capacities for the left to break this power of capital? Actually, I think that the rupture point and the problem for the, QP, for the German government and for the Eurozone is Italy, not France. <clears throat> and for, I would say, basic, basically for two interrelated reasons. The French manufacturing sector has been diminished to 10% of the GDP. That is more or less the same 
as in, as in the UK. And the key problem of the French manufacturing sector is not so much the productivity, but the size. The size is already very small. And it has had for, for a long time a deficit in the capital goods sector, and that has been aggravated. And <clears throat> therefore, the program for leaving the Eurozone, from my point of view, does not have a real support among capital in France. And therefore, we could observe the vacillating position of Front, of Front National. First saying, exiting, then saying, maybe not exiting now. <laughs> maybe never like exiting. So I, I would say that reflects the political economy of France. In Italy, things are different. First of all, the structure of, first of all, the manufacturing sector in Italy is much larger than in France. Secondly, the structure of the manufacturing sector is different as well, because partially it is rather medium-sized to small manufacturing and domestic factoring, and being rather reliant on the manufacturing activities as such, not so strongly financialized. This sector actually has an interest in leaving the Eurozone, and I would say it does have a political representative as well, and that is Lega Nord, to some extent. And Lega Nord, contrary to Front National, has systematically campaigned for leaving the Eurozone. It has really been a focus of their activity. And Lega Nord has tried now to expand to other reasons regions of Italy with very limited success. And from, uh, Liga Nord, for example, in its materials is arguing that the lira was not good for the south of Italy. And now Italy is in the same position regarding, in regard to Germany as the south of Italy was to the north of Italy, and the, therefore the euro is a problem. It argues in favor of not only of uh, leaving the Eurozone, but as well in favor of industrial policies. And so far, I would say the political equation is different. How the other political formations, like Berlusconi's or even more complicated Cinque Stelle, never, nobody knows what the Cinque Stelle really, what constellation of Stelle it is. Very difficult, that's very difficult to say. And the Italian banking sector has obviously a very serious, has confronting very serious problems. So far, there is, that is a complicating factor as well. Italy is less Europeanized than many other countries in the EU. That makes a certain difference as well. Therefore, Personally, I think breaking point, like most likely breaking point from my point of view in the Eurozone is Italy. But it will not be a break from the left, from, unfortunately. I am afraid it will be rather a break from, from the right. Because the left in Italy has very much weakened and its position regarding the EU, the Eurozone, I would say it is... Uh, at least very ambiguous. Hmm? And I would say as well that one of the questions neglected for a very long time by the left-wing forces has been the question of the structure of the productive, se of the productive sectors. Not only of industry, but as well of, of other sectors. And an overemphasis on the issues of the, wel of the welfare state. But alternatives require, obviously, a change in the, productive, in the productive sphere. And, for example, in the periphery, specialization in tourism and agro-industry and construction is not, I would say, it is not viable. And it is one of the, of the limitations. Disaster. It is, a, it is a disaster. But for Germany, I would say there are almost elements of a monostructure as well, and there is a need as well. And it is a taboo 
as well. The car industry is a taboo as well, but it, I would say in the longer run, it is not ecological sustainable. So far, the ecological question needs to be linked to the question of, of, industrial, of industrial policies, because one would need a different type of industrial policies, ones that would be ecologically much more sensitive than, than now, and a certain re-regionalization of the productive circuits for them being more inward, I would say, more inward looking than they are now, not outward, but <laughs> inward looking. And that needs, in the periphery, protection. Yeah. Zoltan, do you, do you wish to respond? Uh, especially, uh, you come from Hungary, and in Hungary, as in, a, as in a, uh, other Eastern periphery, we can see a uh, very strong uh, rep repressive economic policies that, that are then reflected in a very uh, political uh, rep uh, repressive repressive appar apparatus, as as in rising of uh, oligarchic tendencies. So uh, the the rise of Orban uh, is. Um, it is, it is not something that's only happening, this oligarchic tendency are not something that's only happening in Hungary, but we can see it also uh, in uh, Serbia with Vucic, uh, in, uh, in Macedonia with uh, Gruevski. How do, you, how do you connect this uh, uh, repressive economic policies and uh, rising political oligarchies? Okay, I think the answer to that question begins with something that uh, Kostas was saying during his talk, he said, the questions are not really economic, the questions are political. And I think that the economically speaking, we have a much clearer understanding of what's happening. The puzzle is more of a political puzzle. And I think the political puzzle comes from the structure of our societies where you have a larger middle class, upper middle class with liberal interests. And so basically from a relatively small middle class liberal group, we have grown to have a relatively large middle class group which has overtaken social democratic parties. So we used to have liberal parties, small liberal parties of about five, six, ten percent representing the liberal part of the uh, the upper middle classes and the elite. Uh, these people have realized that they will. It's much harder to gain control of government if you are a five, six, ten percent liberal party. So they have basically penetrated and taken over the social democratic parties, and not surprisingly, many political scenes, the liberal parties have been ejected out of parliament. FDP in Germany being the prime example, but also in Hungary, the liberal party is out of parliament. And many other places, the liberal parties are either very, very small or have been ejected out of the parliament. And this is because the upper middle classes and the liberal elites have taken over the social democratic parties. The social democratic parties have, in reality, carried out liberal economic policies, market liberalism, market fundamentalism, which was very unpopular with people lower down. Now, that was also the case, for instance, in the United States with uh, the Clinton era. It was the case with Blair, etc., etc. It was the case with Schroeder, and I could go on. Now, therefore, we have a large liberal bloc which holds on to the social democratic parties. We have a non-voting part in the, at the bottom of society whom nobody represents. Some of these people end up voting for the Le Pens and the radical right. Some of them don't vote. And so this kind of division enables the political right the conservative mainstream political right to become strong. Now, Orban is not popular 
in spite of the fact that he has won two elections, actually three elections already, and next year he's going to win his fourth election, Viktor Orban is not popular. We have eight million voters in Hungary, and out of eight million voters, something like 2.2 vote for Viktor Orban. 2.2 voted for him in 2002, 2.2 voted for him in 2010, 2014, and next year 2.2 are going to vote for him again. He holds together about one-fourth of the electorate. Why is he the Prime Minister of Hungary in spite of the fact that he can only hold on to every fourth adult voter? It's because the other side has completely collapsed. It's because the Social Democrats have become unpopular because they carried out neoliberal policies, they were corrupt, and they basically were controlled by the Liberal Party. And so basically, there's a lot of reluctance to vote for these people. So the people who were their previous voters have either become non-voters or at the very bottom, they are now voting for the far right. So basically, these people are kept in power by the collapse of the left. Why can't the left bring, get its act together? Because the left is, at least the mainstream social democratic parties are, constantly dominated by the upper middle classes and the liberal part of the elite. And they keep insisting on this, this identity politics. So rather than class politics, which would reveal class issues in a vertical way, they keep on insisting on horizontal identity politics. So rather than asking the question of why is it that people in the rust belt of the US are now voting for Trump, how did the, the socioeconomic positions of these people develop over time? They're bringing back identity politics. When Trump says it's the Mexicans, it's the Chinese, then the Clinton machine is very happy to respond, no, it's not, and you're being a racist, and therefore this identity politics prevails. It's the same thing in Hungary. Rather than asking the issue of whether Viktor Orban is an oligarch or the social democrats are oligarchs, the question that's always asked is, we are now threatened by migrants. Now, the number of migrants who have ended up in Hungary is actually equal to zero, uh, but Hungary is one of the societies in Europe which is most afraid of migrants, who are nowhere. It's a little bit like, you know, I'm sure in Croatia you also have this, uh, along with Santa Claus, there is this uh, black devil. Do you have this in Croatia? In some countries of Europe you have that, some kind of a guy who's a black devil, who's like a mythical figure, uh, Zwarte Piet in, in Dutch, uh, in many other countries you have this kind of mythical black figure who people, you know, they, they scare children with. You have that. Hmm? <laughs> uh, so basically, basically a non-existent person that everybody knows, but nobody has ever met. So this in Hungary today is the migrant. Uh, no one's ever seen one. We don't have them. But everybody's very afraid that we will be challenged by these people. Um, and so it's, it's incredible. Like, it's, when they measure fear of people, you know, who people are afraid of, there's a, like two thirds of society are very afraid of these people who are not there. Uh, so this kind of identity politics replaces class politics. It's perpetuated not only by the right. I mean, this is a mistake that we always make. We only believe that Orban and Trump and, these, and Le Pen are the people who perpetuate it. No, actually the liberal part of the elite are very happy to perpetuate it as well because they can oppose it. So the, the debates are identity politics debates. It's beware of the Mexicans, beware of the Syrians, no, you're a racist, but you beware of the Mexicans, beware of the Syrians, no, you are a racist. And this is what you get 24 hours, uh, 365 days. What you don't get is both parts of these elites, the Clintons and the Orbans, uh, the Trumps and the whoever, are just as much oligarchs 
as everybody else. So both parts of the elites are made up of oligarchs, but this kind of vertical issues of top, top and bottom don't get discussed in the media. So I think the clue to understanding the situation is with people like uh, uh, Antonio Gramsci, uh, Italian Marxist political scientist who basically said there is a hegemonic discourse, hegemonic cultural discourse from the elites. People like uh, Pulanzas, Greek-French guy who talked about classes and how our societies are not broken into a simple division of capitalists and workers, but it's much more differentiated. And these differentiated class interests are represented in the political scene. So I think until we get into this discussion, like the political representation of the different very varied classes in our societies, I think we're not getting closer to answering the issue of why the right is so dominant in, in, in Europe today or and in America. Uh, and I think we're nowhere near. We're nowhere near that. Like it, these discussions are on the fringes. Uh, we are still discussing, you know, racism, identity politics. We're stuck at this level. It's very difficult to explain to people that below identity politics is a class politics. Because whenever Le Pen, Le Pen appears, immediately everybody rushes to Macron. Macron creates Le Pen, Le Pen creates Macron. Um, Trump creates Clinton, Clinton creates Trump. But it's very difficult to explain that to people because the immediate threat is Trump. So you have to rush to the Clintons. You have to rush to the Macrons. And there will always be a Trump. Before Trump, there was a Bush. Before Bush, there was a, a Reagan. There will always be a Trump. There will always be an Orban. There will always be a Le Pen. And you will always rush to the Macrons and you will always run to the, to the Clintons. And the Bernie Sanders will never get a chance, I think, if, if you keep on insisting on this identity debate. Thank you, Zoltan. Uh, Joachim wants to, you want to respond. Just look at one point. I would, actually, I would say that we have two different forms of right-wing authoritarianism. One is a neoliberal form of rule-based pol policies and policy making. That is the EU form and the German ordo-liberal form of politics, of disempowering parliaments, of empowering the ex executive bodies, and certain type of strategic, strategic selectivity, and it is very closely linked to the EU. The nationalist right has, a, I would say, a more traditional form of authoritarianism, of a fusion of the different branches of the state, of marginalizing the judiciary, of referendum, referendum forms, of plebiscitary forms of gaining, uh, of representing the so-called national will, as Erdogan uh, calls it, mili irade, yes, and I mean, they have similar forms as, as well. And so far, the response to the loss of representativity, representativity and erosion of the social base is as well two different forms of, author, of authoritarianism. And it is, I think it shows as well the erosion of uh, what Gramsci called he hegemony. It is a non-hegemonic, in a certain way it is a non-hegemonic situation as well rather a question of, of different forms of, of dominance and of force and at times clientelism and new forms of clientelism gaining, uh, gaining importance. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, now I, can o I will open the floor for the questions from the audience. First, uh, you, you presented a nice presentation. I'd like to congratulate all of you, and actually, and, and also thank you for, for these thought-provoking lectures. But uh, I wanted a little bit to challenge you in, my, in particular, Costas. You, you, 
uh, gentleman sitting next to me for, your, for our guests was actually Budimir Lonchar. He was uh, one of the closest alliance, uh, uh, sort of uh, associates of Tito in former Yugoslavia, one of the top officials, you know. So he was for Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and so on and so forth. Uh, now I'll ask him actually, what was the foreign debt of Yugoslavia when it fell apart? So in 1990, there was 24 million people and foreign debt was 16 billion dollars actually 16 billion dollars so it was like around 22 up to 23 percent and he said probably actually it was never beyond 24 percent now i'm talking to about croatia which is having offering several figures from 48 to till 58 million euro billion euros actually foreign debt more than 115 percent of the gdp so we are talking about yugoslavia i'm not i assure you i'm not trying to be Hugo nostalgic you know so, we are talking about the country that, before it fell apart, out of 24 million people, one-third was owing a property that has been built by the Yugoslav state. We are talking about the state that actually offered free education to every citizen. Like, and I'm speaking about the highest level, even the PhD. Yeah. I'm talking about the state that was offering wonderful welfare state, you know, like actually wonderful medical care, social care, social transfers, and so on and so forth. If that's the case, you know, what you said, Costa, about, uh, about the left, you know, like, or all the saying that left, you know, elites are actually losing the, the people. My question is, how does it happen that actually these not people, the working class people, that annoy me, like, actually, <laughs> enormously, personally, like, vote, I'm not going to have this state anymore. I'm not going to state that will take care of me. I'm not going to state that. How do, does it happen that actually these people actually lean towards right? You know, even even when you know the the left really delivered so many things, you know, and that was the thing, you know. How did it happen? Because I'm not so sure whether I completely subscribe to your explanation of these kind of things, you know, we have lost the, 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 the left in crisis, you know, what's left of the left, you know, uh, how could we offer, uh, right is using our rhetorics, you know, people are leaning there. What happened before? You know, how did we manage to get into this situation? Thank you. Very broad question. I will not presume to tell a group of you know, Croats, <laughs> you know, whatever else, Yugoslavs, ex-Yugoslavs here, what went wrong with Yugoslavia, right? I will not, I will, I will not presume to do that. Feel free to tell. <laughs> yeah, you want to know. Yeah, we're working class as well, because it's a general. Yeah, from your perspective, from a person who is from Greece, you also going to your parents' grave and cry for them. So culture means a lot to you, same as us, gracious. Feel free to. Yeah. <laughs> Very important in these, I, I, again, I, I will generalize, but then I'll come to the left because uh, now. Um, very important in these uh, affairs, uh, it, the, the way social formations develop, are two things. It isn't simply the provision of goods and, and basic services to people and a, a foundation of uh, equality that you create in access to material goods a kind of uh, social democracy in this respect. This, that's not uh, enough in this regard. What is also necessary is to secure a system whereby the productivity of labor can continue to rise, that uh, output can continue to rise systematically, that incomes can continue to rise systematically, and that the, the country can progress in that respect by changing its own structure. And from what I know, there were endless problems in ex-Yugoslavia about that, how to secure that, and there were endless problems associated with how to run the big enterprises in a way that would ensure this. Problems of governance, problems of structure of enterprises, um, and that would ensure the rising productivity and growing ability to, uh, to, 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 to participate in the world economy. That problem was never solved satisfactorily in ex-Yugoslavia, as I, as I understand it. Um, and that has repercussions for the debt that you pointed out, the, the tendency to borrow and so on. So, so there was an economic problem after a while. And I'm sure that there were also ideological problems, problems of democracy, problems of expression of, um, 
opinion, participation in public affairs. Uh, it wasn't exactly a paradise in terms of um, public debate, was it, and in terms of freedom and so on. So the combination of these things proved um, very destructive for the ability of that social formation to survive, and other factors also intervened. And national question. National question of paramount importance, of course. It's just about the only form of, the only country of the ex sort of Eastern Bloc, broadly speaking, that collapsed into nationalist wars, uh, vicious wars. Now, again, the point is, though, what you're saying is important, though, in terms of where we go now and what, how the left positions itself now. The left in Europe has emerged as a current, as a, historic, a historical current from the French Revolution onwards that basically speaks for the saint you know, for, speaks for the speaks for the for the poor speaks for the disenfranchised speaks for the uh, um, the plebeian layers of europe that's where the left is that's where the left has come from uh, and and he has always positioned itself as the, the the political current that is prepared to challenge the established order and the established structures of power in favor and together with the bottom layers of society. It's a basic principle of equality, of establishing equality, of establishing justice in this way. These are fundamental ideas of the left, which Karl Marx found around. He didn't think of them himself, okay? If the left loses that connection, if the left loses its rootedness in those social layers and in those ideas of, of revolt, of, 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 of overturning the institutions of capitalism, of bringing a different society about, if the left loses that, then the left counts for nothing. And it doesn't matter, it can cease existing. It, it, it means nothing in, in Europe. We can find other social currents that will do the same. What's the use of the left if it loses that? And in this connection, the biggest disappointment, in some ways, historical disappointment, is social democracy. I must admit I, that I did not expect and I, I completely misread it. When the Eastern Bloc collapsed, a new historic opportunity emerged for social democracy. The split in the left between the communist left and the social democratic left occurred around the time of the First World War. The Zimmerwald Conference, as you know. Um, the communist tradition declined and effectively failed after the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. At that time, I and others thought maybe the Social Democrats will come back now historically and say we were right, <laughs> right? We were right. And now that we have won, because they did win, we will now proceed to manage capitalism in a social democratic way. We will intervene in the market, regulate the market, uh, and so on, dictate terms, and create a social democratic type of capitalism. They did nothing of that, nothing. What the social democrats did after the collapse of the Eastern Bloc was to say, capitalism is the only way to manage the world, the market is the only way to manage the world, neoliberalism is the only way to manage the world, you cannot go against the market, you must do what the market says, they became neoliberal. Social democracy became neoliberal, and Tony Blair is the perfect expression of that. He is the best creation of Margaret Thatcher, right? Uh, Tony Blair is. So, after 30 years of this, the social democrats turn around and say, why are people not following us? Yes, I wonder why. <laughs> you know, it's a mystery. Why, is it, why, why are they moving away? Well, of course. So, but you start as example shows that actually a working class is not an angelic. You know, should not be I, okay, an okay, I don't want to. That's, that's I, don't, why I, offer this example in I don't want this to turn. Let me just say. Let me just say one thing. Just think, I don't want this to turn into speaking for the poor, speaking for the plebeian layers, speaking for the downtrodden and for the lowest in society, is not the same thing as imagining that they are angelic. No one says that. No one ever said that. If people imagine that, then they don't understand how society is structured. The poor are not angels and they're not saints. Of course, anybody who's gone near them understands. But the, the argument about connecting with the poor and drawing strength from the poor and from the plebeian layers is an argument about who's got an interest in changing the world and who's got some social health about them. That's an argument that we need to tackle. 
uh, and we have a rich history in doing that. Okay, Joachim wanted something to remark, but uh, just to, to add on on, uh, on this, uh, we can we can see social so, so, social democratic parties falling apart in your Euro, uh, in Europe. Uh, the pasokization of uh, uh, social uh, socialists in uh, in uh, France. We also can see it in uh, Spain, uh, in Italy, uh, but. Uh, in, uh, but at the same time, we have a uh, big rise of uh, left platforms with uh, Melanchon now in France, with uh, Bernie Sanders in uh, who, who, who has revived uh, social who has revived social democracy in uh, in uh, Great Britain, also with uh, Bernie Sanders, and a lot of younger voters are coming to these new left formations. What, uh, to what extent do you see the? Possibilities and capacities of these new left for, uh, formations to challenge the to challenge the power of capital in the f in the future. Yaki. Speaking about it's mainly speaking about Southern Europe, and very often in countries where the social democrat tradition used to be fairly weak, including in a certain way, including France, <clears throat> and. With a tradition to the left of social democ to the left of, of social democracy, and now partially in, in new forms like Bloco de Esquerda in Portugal, Podemos in, in in Spain. But nevertheless, and I think partially in the case of southern southern Europe as well, the still relatively recent experience of right-wing author authoritarian or even fascist, fascist regimes. I mean, that's only 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. it should not be, I think that should not be forgotten. It's a different, it's different situation. Nevertheless, these formations uh, face the same, face a problem of finding ways of combining a more egalitarian vision with restructuring of the productive sector. And I would say very often the second question is not very intensively tackled from my point of view, from what I have I've read. That includes Podemos as well from my point of view. It's too much focused on the question of distribution, in important questions, but I think a key challenge for breaking the mold is to transform the economy as well. And personally, we can see certain changes are possible within the Eurozone. That is the Portuguese case. But the Portuguese case of a coalition of a government of the Socialist Party supported by Communist Party in Bloco de Esquerda is not able to tackle the underlying question of the peripheral structure of the Portuguese economy. And so far, I would say the changes remain, fair, remain fairly limited and the vulnerability quite high because current account deficit always limits the space for maneuver. And the case of Yugoslavia was cited. Always current account deficit. Yugoslavia was never able to do away with the current account deficit. And so far, a certain degree of external dependence persisted in spite, in spite of conscious industrialization efforts. Hmm? Second, second issue, question of internal unequal development was not resolved. Between Slovenia and Kosovo, the gap was increasing. Very, I would say it was a very, that was a very serious problem. In addition, uh, almost confederal constitution in 1974. And I mean, the 1980s, nevertheless, they were characterized by permanent, by permanent crisis. And the central government of Makovic applied austerity policies. And I mean, that does not help to create a popular base from my point of view. The pro-Yugoslav left of the Udrogenie uh, Yugoslav Demokratitske Initiative, 
I mean, it was, in the, in, to a significant extent, it supported the austerity policies of Markovic. Should not be forgotten, and I think that was one of the structural limitations. And I would argue that this may be a lesson the left in the EU should learn from Yugoslavia, that is not to support the austerity policies of the central authority. I mean, in that case, it would be the European Commission. Huh? I think at least that lesson can be, can be learned from, uh, from Yugoslavia. And I think a second lesson is that it is very essential to deal with the uneven development patterns. Huh? Otherwise, the nationalist right will capitalize on the issue uh, of that, from my point of view. And insinuating a certain type of protection, which in many cases is a pseudo protection. And it should be seen that within the Communist Party, you talked about, or oh, here was the League of Communists, I mean, with the help of the former cadres of the League of Communists, like Milosevic, Yukanovic, I mean, the oligarchy was created in the successor states as well. And so far, one has to have a look at how the League of Communists changed over, over its 40, more than 40 years of, uh, of, of government as well. And I would say it became very heterogeneous internally as well, with different class forces being present within the League of Communists. Thank you. And on that note, we must finish because the next panel is about to start. So thank you all for coming. Thank <laughs> you.